Hi, I'm Matthew Burchette, and this is a, ooh, ooh, a behind the wings at Denver International Airport. That's Lucifer. You don't want to make him mad. This program was made possible by Wings Over the Rockies, educating and inspiring people of all ages about aviation and space endeavors of the past, present, and future. Now I say this a lot, but how cool is this? You guys are getting a really inside look at this thing. Not everyone gets to do that. Bam! 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 In the 1920s, Denver was in serious danger of being left in the dust by Cheyenne as a major air hub. So, the Denver Aeronautical Commission decided that if Denver was to become a major air transportation center, it needed to create the best airport facility between St. Louis and the West Coast. They did, and Denver Municipal Airport opened on October 17, 1929. In 1944, Denver Municipal was renamed Stapleton Airfield after Ben Stapleton, Denver's mayor when it was built and a major proponent of aviation. Then in 1964, the airport was again renamed to Stapleton International Airport. By the 1980s, Stapleton had expanded as much as was practical. Air traffic continued to increase, but the airport was exceeding its capacity to handle all the traffic and passengers. One major limitation was that the parallel runways were too close together and couldn't handle simultaneous instrument approaches during low visibility. After years of planning and construction, Denver International Airport was opened on February 28, 1995. At that time, DIA was the first new major airport to be built since Dallas-Fort Worth more than 21 years earlier in 1974. Before we go and check out DIA, let's look at an artifact in our collection that encapsulates Denver's airport history. This is the Progress of Flight Mural, and it was actually in Stapleton Airport up on the mezzanine level. Now, not an artifact is Jeff Reddy. Jeff, Thank you so much for being here. Now, your dad was the architect of record for Stapleton Airport, which means that basically he designed the thing. That's right. Uh, actually, my dad started working at Stapleton uh, back in early 1950s and continued uh, working really up until its closing. So did he actually have something to do with this as well? Yes, this mural was part of the terminal that was built in 19... Uh, 62 roughly and opened in 64. He worked very closely with a local uh, mosaic tile uh, manufacturer uh, working out the scale and the colors and making sure everything fit so I was I was really happy that was able to be salvaged and moved and is here in the museum. Now. Yeah well we are really glad to have it because it is a really interesting piece. Now you also brought some stuff from your own collection that probably nobody has ever seen for a really long time. Can we take a look at that stuff? Let's do. I'd yeah. like to share it. Oh, excellent. Wow. This is really cool. This is something that you just don't see anymore. This is an actual watercolor. Right. This is dated uh, 1952. So at this point, Denver had realized they really needed more terminal capacity as well as airport capacity. So this was a major project for Denver to construct a new terminal. Uh, shown here is, uh, we have an, uh, kind of the old iconic uh, clock tower that uh, remained in place even as Stapleton expanded, that clock tower stayed and uh, the new terminal was built around it. Uh, this area is a corporate center for United Airlines. Denver was United's home base. It was their home up until the uh, early 1970s. So 
Uh, United had a presence right on the terminal. It was their main offices. And now tell me about this one. I can see there's the clock tower again, but this is completely different. Well, this was the concept that was started in the early 1960s because it was again obvious to Denver that they needed much more capacity. Uh, jets were becoming uh, passenger aircraft of choice and Denver had to keep up with what was expanding. So this was a, a concept at the time. It was uh, not exactly followed. As you can see, this has a very large hotel. Uh, okay. Denver was maybe a little in the forefront of thinking of a hotel at their airport. Uh, not many airports had done that. And so that was uh, part of the concept that was not followed through, but really the terminal as it was constructed pretty well followed this, this rendering. I love that they kept the clock tower. That's, uh, I wish we had kept it. And now here, again, there's the clock tower but they've kind of followed this circular pattern. There's no hotel, but this is dated 1979, so this is definitely Stapleton. This is how, as it was finally constructed. Uh, as you can see, we do have a new control tower, which- Right, is, which is still there. That's the only element of Stapleton that's still in place, but- huh. And then knowing that even with all of this, we were gonna need something more, bam, you guys come up with this, which was a concept in 67 for a whole new airport. Exactly, I think it would, became very apparent to the Denver leadership that the airport was gonna to have to move sooner or later, so uh, this was a concept that was developed in the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Oh, so this, this was not really even thought to be out at the uh, DIA area not at this point. I think even then we realized uh, the, the arsenal was going to be a, a candidate, and okay. it was looked at even when uh, DIA was built, but it was really too restrictive in the amount of land that was available at the arsenal, which really directed them to move further east and get a lot more real estate for a much bigger airport. Yeah, like they always do. you got to have more land. Well, Jeff, Thank you so much for being here and bringing these amazing photos and renderings. These guys have not seen the light of day in what, 30 or 40 years probably? At least. Wow, that is really cool. That is really special. Now that you have the backstory of Denver's airports, it's time to head over to our friends at DIA to get an exclusive behind the scenes tour of their facilities and uncover their deep, dark secrets. So this is the Jefferson Terminal and we're in the Great Hall. And as you can see, it looks kind of a little bit slow today at TSA. How many people though do you have come through every year? Over 61 million passengers navigate Holy through our God. facility. That's a ton of people. What's kind of the average wait time? On an off-peak period, it's going to vary. Um, we try to maintain approximately 15 minute wait time or under. And DIA has three areas for TSA security. We do, we have three checkpoints. Um, we have one checkpoint that remains open 24 seven. Okay. And then the other two checkpoints are generally open from 4 a.m. to approximately 9 p.m. So one of the things that's going on right now is DIA is making some huge changes and this is actually one of the areas where you guys are gonna make changes. Now, right down in the middle, right there with kind of the, the white baggage looking thing. That's one of the, the changes you guys have already implemented already. Traditionally, screening lanes have been more linear. And so you basically waited for the person in front of you to process through the screening lane. Right. The automated screening lanes allow multiple people to divest or to take off their screened items at the same time. And so you can see there's a multiple drop locations yeah. and you're not waiting for the person in front of you. You can actually progress forward even if the person in front of you hasn't unloaded in preparation for that screening process. Has that sped up the process? They say there's a, a significant increase on those particular lanes. And so hopefully the idea would be that once we have all lanes 
for automated screen lane that will definitely significantly increase our throughput. Now it looks like there's not a TSA agent actually looking at the screen. Is So when you say automated, it runs through the x-ray machine and the x-ray machine figures out through an algorithm or something that if there might be something in the baggage that they need to flag? The technology assists the staffing of the TSA to identify any item that may be a threat or requires additional screening. Now, one of the things that I've been told that will be a drastic change in here, and you don't have to answer this question or not, but right now this is not really ideal because here we are looking straight down, and if I go right down to that far end, that's a, that's a clean area, and if I really wanted to, I could drop something to somebody. Yeah, so, so that's gonna change. That, that is gonna change, and there is a vulnerability of having this vantage point over the checkpoint. Um, and I think that that, again, is why we're moving the direction we are to have the checkpoints on level six. That makes sense. From the Great Hall, I headed outside to get a tour of the airfield. My guide for the day was Director of Operations Bruce Getz, who showed me the amazing features of this airport. Did you know that DIA has six runways, each dedicated either to takeoffs or landings? And these babies are huge. In fact, DIA has the longest commercial runway in North America at 16,000 feet long. Now, I know a lot of you have wondered, hey, why is this airport so far from downtown? Well, the forefathers who envisioned DIA had long-term growth in mind. Currently, the airport sits on roughly 53 square miles of land. That's enough room to build six more runways without purchasing another acre of land. Most airports located closer to cities have land restrictions and struggle to build even one runway. So it won't be long until DIA jumps to the fourth busiest airport on the continent. Next, Bruce and I headed up into the ramp tower, which controls all the traffic in the ramp area. What we're looking at out these windows is literally all the movement of the aircraft to and from the gates, out to the taxiways, all that kind of stuff. And right now we're in a lull, That's as correct. you call it. A little bit of a slow period right now. This is between banks, this early afternoon period. And as you mentioned before, the FAA tower wants to only control runways and taxiways and they want the rest of this area in the center of the airport around the concourses. They don't want to manage that, so that's left up to our controllers and the United controllers to manage all the movement of aircraft coming into and out of the gate area. Uh, the controllers up here have a lot of neat tools to manage things safely. Up above is our Aerobond system, and that's a real-time display of arriving and departing aircraft. So this is, I mean, literally real time. Mm -hmm. One second update, so wow. as that 757 is making the turn up there, we'll immediately see him making the turn. So when we were boogieing around out there in, the, in your super awesome ops truck, yep. we would have shown up on this. That's correct, um, and I don't see right another there. vehicle, but our vehicle would have said Ops 5 because okay. it has a transponder in it that's broadcasting our signal, which is Ops 5. That's the whole goal of uh, being out here is just safety, knowing where everybody is in relationship to everyone else. It also keeps you from going out there and taking a nap. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose we could see if you parked in one place for a long time. We do operate this facility 24 hours a day, seven days a week. There's always somebody up here. Um, and so they're a, a great dedicated group of people that really know their job well and making sure this airport is running at maximum efficiency and the passenger is everything. And the reality is, yes, there are gonna be hiccups. There's gonna be hiccups here the same way there are in Atlanta or Chicago O'Hare, but there's a lot of folks behind the scenes making sure that that delay, if it's there, is really minimized. Not only is the ramp tower helping you make your flight on time, but so is the snow removal team. DIA is famous for having one of the largest snow removal teams in the world. Let's head over to the field maintenance center to see how these guys operate. Whoa, that is an amazing plow. What's even more amazing, this guy, Rich Brannon. He's the AD of field maintenance for DIA. How cool is that job? So Rich, you guys are like 
a tiny little, well, not even tiny, you're like public works. Right, yeah, Just we for are. DIA, tell me what you guys do out here. So we are, we are a, a big department. We're about 150 strong. Um, we pretty much do all the preventative maintenance here at DIA. Um, we have basically two seasons, summer and winter. <laughs> um, summer we do, uh, you know, basic maintenance. We do paving, we do some concrete repair. Wow. Uh, we do some repairs on the runways and taxiways. Um, we do erosion, fence, fence repair. Um, we do mowing. We have 53 square miles we basically maintain. Whoa. Um, Seriously? 53 square 53 miles? 53 square miles. And we're, you guys uh, don't use handheld mowers? No, only, uh, okay. only, if, uh, yeah, only if you're on the bad list or something. <laughs> but no, uh, lots of tractors, lots of mowers, um, tons of equipment. Um, we're 365 days a year, um, so we're here all time. And then we transition into the snow, which is today. Yeah. Um, yeah. And we have over almost 200 pieces of equipment just in snow alone. And uh, yeah, we take care of the airfield, so runways, taxiways. Mm -hmm. So speaking of snow removal, DIA has a 16,000 foot runway, which is literally the longest runway in North America. How do you plow that and not just back up planes for hours and hours? Right, so with the 200 pieces of snow equipment we have, we divide the airfield in half. So we have an east side and a west side runway team. Um, that runway in particular is on the west side, so we have approximately 22 pieces of equipment that clear that runway alone. So uh, we're able to clear that runway anywhere between 12 to 15 minutes. And we have certain formations that we do that in, uh, depending on the snow and the wind. Um, no we have, so we'll go down the runway in a certain way and it's one pass and the runway's clear. If I worked here, I would constantly be in trouble and I would be that kind of broom. Yeah. Rich took me inside their storage area to see their whole equipment collection, and it was nothing short of impressive. With over 200 pieces of equipment, you can be assured that any snow falling on DIA is efficiently dealt with. Back outside, Rich had one more huge piece of equipment to show me. This is not small. No. <laughs> so, I mean, not only do you have this uh, plow, You've got like a whole broom thing going on down there. What is this? So in addition with the, uh, the Boshan that we were at earlier, um, we have blowers, we have runway brooms, um, we use loaders, box plows, and then we have these. These are the MBs. So we have 26 of these. Um, they are a 72 foot piece of equipment. They have a 24 foot plow, a little over six and a half feet tall, obviously. You can stand underneath it uh, with the 22 foot broom. and. Uh, these are one of our hardest working pieces of equipment that we use. These are the ones that we use to clear the runways and um, they're huge. So <clears throat> why a broom versus a plow or why a combo? So unlike uh, removing snow on a street, um, the runways have to be cleaned completely to the pavement. So you can't have any residual on the, uh, the actual taxiways or the runways for airplane to kind of land and take off and transport around in the air. Okay, so, that makes sense. Yep, so the plow actually takes off the grunt of the snow and then the broom just basically brooms off the residual that's left that the plow leaves and cleans it completely. So to the you're pavement. literally getting, I mean, right down to right the, to the pavement. Right to the pavement, yep. And then we treat it with sand or chemical or whatever. So this thing is longer than a semi truck. Yep. How much training goes into the, I mean, you don't want to just throw me in this thing because it would be a disaster. <laughs> right, so you have to have a CDL. I mean, that's a class B or a class A. Okay. Uh, most of our drivers have class A's. Um, we have a robust uh, training program here. We have a separate division that actually does the training. Um, our guys are trainers. Um, we have a lot of experience here. A uh, very diverse group that um, knows what they're doing. and. Uh, we train each other and we go through a program. It's almost all year round. I was about to say, and that's gotta be all year round. Yeah. Yeah. Even with all that training and all the equipment, has there ever been a time that the snow just got the best of you? Yeah, unfortunately um, we have. We've had a few storms where the wind actually becomes an issue. It's uh, more visibility than is the snow depth that we have uh, to fight. Yeah. Um, we're able to clear the snow. We have the equipment to do that, but um, 50 mile an hour winds and plus uh, tend to take the visibility away. And when it becomes unsafe, then we kind of have to pull off. So we did, uh, 2015, we had a uh, uh, about a seven hour closure due to the winds, um, due to the visibility, and it just wasn't safe to be out. I remember that storm, that was a, a bear. Yep, but we got back in it and- we... Yeah, there's not really any kind of windbreak out here, is no, there? No, <laughs> not at all, yep, not at all. Say I'm sitting on my plane and I'm waiting to take off and the snow is falling and I'm getting a little bit angry right um, what can you say to me that's going to calm me down just to 
it's like, look, I'm doing my job, I'm doing it as quickly as I can. You know, what do you want people who are in the planes to know? So, you know, our people, we're, we're a humble group. Uh, we work hard, um, you know, we, we'd, uh, we don't take anything for granted. We're out here for the safety of the public. We know that. Uh, we care about the public. It's, you know, it's what we do. Um, so, you know, they're families and, you know, they, they make major sacrifices to be out here. We're out here all the time, making sure that the airfield is clean for the passengers and making sure that everything's safe for them. So, That's awesome. Yep, absolutely. Since snow is in the forecast, I left these guys to their work and headed back to the Great Hall. Here I met up with Chief Financial Officer Gisela Shanahan to talk about the impact DIA has on Denver and what's in store for the future. So, let's see, I think it was 2017, you guys had over 61 million passengers through DEN. 61.4, it was a record-breaking year. We're on track for another record-breaking year, and we think we'll be at 64 million plus by the time we end December. That's amazing. What it is. kind of economic impact does that have on the Denver area? This is the single largest economic driver in our region as one entity. Uh, the last study that was done to look at that was in 2013. At that point, we were generating 26 billion annually. That's with a B. With a B. So that number, as you can imagine, is much larger. The next study will be out within a year. Uh, but we impact the entire region. And Whether when you say region, you mean going up that's to going Cheyenne. to Wyoming, Kansas. Uh, yes, uh, we are a regional airport. We serve a multi-state region. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. So what is your favorite part about this job? My favorite part is every day is different. Oh, this yeah. is such a dynamic industry. Uh, when you wake up in the morning, guaranteed your day will end very different than what you began because there's <laughs> globally factors can influence what happens here uh, right. nationally regionally here in city and county of Denver, uh, but there are so many factors that drive what happens at an airport any given day. And for those of us who um, like that type of challenge, um, this is really an exciting place to be. You guys are making some huge changes here. Can you give yeah. us a little bit of an idea of what's going on there? Yeah, so when this airport opened its doors in 1995, newest commercial airport in the U.S. as a large airport. Right? At that point in time, we were designed for about 50 million annual passengers. <laughs> Technology has changed. How we move passengers through a check-in process has changed. That's allowed us to continue to get north of 60 million in this facility. But we're preparing for the future right now. And the growth continues here in this region. So we need to be able to serve more than 80 million annual passengers out of this facility. So what you see, million. 80 million, more than that, out of just this one facility. So what we're doing, as you can see, the construction is we're preparing this facility to more efficiently process passengers through, expanding our security checkpoints. We're adding 30% capacity in the gates to make sure more aircraft can come and go and deliver those passengers. All right, so since there are gonna be a lot of people who are probably either have been here or will go mm -hmm. through DEN, what would you want a typical passenger to kind of know about day-to-day -day operations? I think what people don't know about an airport is that it is literally a city in and of itself. Yeah, no so kidding. everything you need to be able to take care of a passenger is all located here. So 35,000 people work at the airport in one capacity or another, along with hundreds of businesses. So whether that's an airline that most people think of or the airport itself, all the food and beverage services, the retail, uh, the rental cars, all of that together creates that entire city that works together like a well-tuned machine to get everyone through and out on their way. And our job is to make that journey that you take as a passenger as pleasant and seamless as possible. After talking with Gisela, she wished me luck as I headed down into the depths of DIA. You know what I'm talking about, the tunnel. All right, we're where everybody wants to be. We're in the tunnels underneath DIA. This is where all the weird stuff goes on, supposedly, but not really. This is just where all the baggage comes. We're actually at baggage claim 17. We're underneath it. So everybody's baggage just comes right through here. It goes onto that conveyor belt. You grab it, you go on your way. No big deal. But for some reason, people believe there are all sorts of weird things going on down here. I don't personally believe it, but it's... Oh, 
I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Disclaimer, that was not a real lizard man. As you can tell, the employees here have a great sense of humor. In fact, there are over a thousand people that work in the baggage tunnels every day. And where exactly are these tunnels, you're wondering? They actually run parallel to the train system that transports passengers to and from the concourses. After some time exploring the labyrinth of tunnels, I was ready to get back up to the surface. You never know what you'll run into down here. If you're a frequent flyer, then you know this airport. It's the fifth busiest airport in the country and even has room to grow. From driving on the airfield with Bruce to touring the amazing selection of snow removal equipment with Rich and even going underground to explore the labyrinth of baggage tunnels, we've taken you behind the wings of Denver International Airport. Yeah, let's get that out of the way. <laughs> I've been wanting to do that all morning. <laughs> See the rest of the, mu uh, the museum. <laughs> Man, I gotta go find lizard men. Have a great day, be safe, watch out. <laughs> all right, thank you. Uh, way to go, Emily Downer. <laughs>